open. Thank you, Carol, for hosting the Zoom meeting and for setting up these programs with our excellent speakers that we have. Thanks to our executive director, Christine Moore, for all her work on social media, including our website, our Facebook page, our Twitter account, and our YouTube channel. Christine has greatly expanded both our accessibility and our audience, and we're grateful for that. And if someone from Bedford TV is recording this, and Carol and I discovered that we don't know that for sure, one way or the other, thanks to you. And if not, then not. Most important welcome is for all of you who joined us today, whether you're from Bedford and its immediate surroundings, or whether you're from further afield. And whether this is your first Bedford Historical Society meeting or your 50th, welcome. If you're a newcomer, you're certainly welcome to join us. It's you and your participation and your interest that make the activities of the society meaningful. The main feature of this meeting today is a presentation by our speaker, Mr. Christopher Daly. Mr. Daly has been lecturing all over New England for over a quarter of a century on interesting historical topics. He's spoken at libraries, historical societies, schools, clubs, and organizations. In fact, he's spoken several times to our society, most recently a couple of years ago on the topic, No Irish Need to Apply. No Irish Need Apply, the History of the Irish in Boston. <clears throat> in addition to his public lectures, Mr. Daly teaches history in the Silver Lake Regional School System in Kingston, Massachusetts. He was formerly the president of the Pembroke Historical Society and chairman of the Pembroke Historical Commission. He has served at the John Alden House as a docent and as the coordinator for educational outreach. He's written articles on various topics for local publications and has recently published a book entitled Murder and Mayhem in Boston, Historic Crimes in the Hub. Mr. Daly holds a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in political science and history from Bridgewater State. And he and his wife now live in Bethlehem, New Hampshire. Today he's speaking about a tragic and not terribly well-known event in the 1620s that involved Plymouth Plantation and another much less successful settlement located in what's now Weymouth. The event significantly damaged relationships between Native Americans and English settlers. <clears throat> we call it the less aggressive incident. <clears throat> if I can ask you to do so, if you have questions, please type them in using the chat facility of Zoom, and Mr. Daly will address them at the end. <clears throat> and after that, if you are unable to make your questions via chat, Mr. Daly will accept the questions after his talk. <clears throat> Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Christopher Daly. Thank you so much, Tom. And I just wanted to say uh, it's it's great being with you once again. I wish it was in person. I really enjoyed being there in the past and uh, giving my various lectures there. Now, this lecture that I'm giving, uh, actually, uh, I, I was telling Carol that I, I haven't given this in I don't know how long. And it's partially because this is a pretty little known uh, event in the history. We all know about the Pilgrims and Thanksgiving and, and Plymouth Rock, but we don't know much about West Augusset, which was the second colony after Plymouth. And uh, it's, it's come down to us in history, a very infamous note. And uh, as I said, a lot of people don't know about it. And the people that do know something about it just know a little bit about it. So. Uh, what we have here is the full story of the events that led up to this incident and uh, a little bit about the aftermath as well. So we'll begin. Really, uh, when you talk about West Augusset, you, you can't talk about West Augusset unless you talk about Plymouth. 
and we'll begin with Plymouth. Let's begin at, at, at the beginning. And of course, this is the old English spelling. Uh, back in Great Britain, the, the pilgrims, the so-called pilgrims were actually religious separatists. They broke away from the Anglican church uh, because they were being harassed and persecuted. And they actually left England much before they went to Plymouth. And they ended up here in Holland. And they, they spent all, about a decade in the city of Leiden. And this is because in Holland, they were able to, uh, they were able to uh, practice their religion the way they saw fit. It was pretty free even back then. But the, the problem was that they saw their children becoming more and more Dutch and that concerned the pilgrims. And they wanted to find a place where they could keep their Englishness and also practice their religion. And they had heard of America. They knew that you could go to America. There, were, there was already Jamestown. Several attempts had been made at colonies and they thought this was the perfect place. The problem was they didn't have enough money to do this. And then they came in contact with this group, the Merchant Adventurers out of London. Now the Merchant Adventurers were a joint stock company formed to make a profit. And they needed people to get over to America and they would do things such as ship lumber back, uh, beaver pelts, fish, any kind of raw resource that could be shipped back to England to make a profit. So they were willing to finance the Pilgrim's trip over to America and also to keep them supplied as long as they were shipping things back that they could make a profit on. So these guys were like, uh, you know, the 17th century version of venture capitalists. They're putting an investment in here and they're hoping that these folks will turn a profit for them. Now, the agent for the merchant adventurers was this man, Thomas Weston, who you'll be hearing a lot about. Uh, West Augusset is also interchangeably known as Weston's Colony. At this point in time, in the beginning of our story, he's just the agent. He's the go-between between the merchant adventurers and the pilgrims. And he arranges everything. He puts the ships together, the supplies, and sets them on their way. And this is what happened right off the bat. There were two ships outfitted, the Mayflower that we know about and the Speedwell. And uh, all of our folks called the Pilgrims got aboard and they set sail. The only problem was the Speedwell started linking and they had to go back. The Speedwell was deemed unseaworthy and they had to jam as many people on board the Mayflower as they could. Some of the, some of the separatists were left behind and they made that famous voyage on the Mayflower. Now, to make a long story short, they landed in Provincetown, they explored the Cape, they had a, an encounter with the Native Americans out there, a military encounter, nobody got killed, there were shots fired, but they decided that they wouldn't, didn't wanna uh, settle on the Cape for that reason, and they ended up finding Plymouth Harbor, and that's where they settled. On uh, near the uh, former Native American village of Tuxet, which was vacant due to a plague that happened in 1618, 1619, that wiped out almost 80% of the Native Americans in the area. So they, they began building, they got a late start. They didn't really start building until December. And people were already sick, they were diseased. Many died during that first horrible winter. Over 50% of the company died. And then finally, when, when winter was starting to wane, there was finally contact with the Native Americans. They had, they had seen glimpses of them. They had seen smokes out in the woods, but they, they hadn't made any contact. And it was on March 16, 1620, that a giant of a man, Samoset, who was a sachem from Maine, came striding right into their village, just like you see here, practically clothed, and he announced, welcome English. And they were astounded. They didn't know why this man could speak English. Well, the story was that he had a lot of contact with English fishermen up in Maine. And the sachem of the Wampanoag people, Massasoit, had brought him in to make contact with the natives. Well, 
within a few days, he returned with another English speaking native and that was the famous Squanto or Tisquantum. And they were told that the, the Massasoit, the chief of the Wampanoag, his name was actually Osamequin, Yellow Feather, was hard by and they wanted to parlay. And before you knew it, there was a, a retinue of 60 men up on the hill above Plymouth. And there was Massasoit. He came down and he was escorted into the village. And they sat down and they had what you call a parlay, I guess, in the, the first uh, common house here. And after, after the talk, they came up with a treaty. And this is the actual wording of the treaty. Without reading the whole thing to you, I'll give you the gist of it. Basically, um, Massasoit was not there to help them because he did this out of the generosity of his heart. Massasoit, Osamequa, needed an ally because to the south were the, were the Narragansett, the Narragansett nation. Now, he was in fear of this nation because his people had succumbed to the plague that I just mentioned. Uh, their numbers uh, went down precipitously. The Narragansett weren't so affected by it and they were starting to encroach on his territory. And he needed an ally. This is the reason why he came to Plymouth. He needed an ally and the pilgrims needed help too because they were surrounded by thousands of Native Americans. They needed a friend too. So they made this treaty of alliance. And also part of this treaty was if somebody commits a crime on their people or so forth, they'll be handed over, which later we'll see uh, somebody didn't live up to that treaty and they, they uh, caused a little bit of trouble down the line here. We'll talk about that. So I just referred to nations. Now, uh, a lot of people, if you're not familiar with Native Americans, you probably wouldn't know this, but uh, some people get tribe and nation mixed up. When we talk about the Wampanoag, we're talking about this area in here. And this, this is a nation. It's made up of many, many villages and tribes, which we'll be hearing about some of those villages and tribes. Here are the Narragansett that I just talked about. And later on, we're going to be hear, hearing about the Massachusetts tribe obviously the tribe that our state is named after. Well, here is old Thomas Weston, and you know, he was not happy because that first year, they did all they could do is to survive and build that colony and the Mayflower went back empty. They were expecting it to be full and they were expecting a lot of money and they were not happy. Those merchant adventurers were not happy when that Mayflower came back empty, but you have to, you have to understand these people were just trying to survive that first year. But these merchant adventurers back in London and especially Weston were not happy. Weston just thought they were spending too much time praying and all that stuff. And he thought that there should be a, a better colony set up. So before we get into things, I wanna talk about two uh, two relationships here that happen, uh, William Bradford and Squanto and Miles Standish and Habamock. Let's talk about these people here because they, they're really important to the story here. Now, any school child probably knows who Squanto is, also known as Tisquantum. That was his full name. Now, he's got a, a really fascinating history. I could do a whole lecture just on Squanto. Give you the short of it. In 1614, he and uh, several other Native Americans were just simply kidnapped by a Captain Hunt, an English captain uh, from Patuxet. They were brought to Spain, to an island off of Spain called Magdala, Spain, and sold as slaves. Long story short, Squanto escapes. He ends up uh, with monks, and they end up uh, over in England, and he learns English and is uh, hosted in England. And then he comes back in 1690 with a Captain Dermer who was to explore the coast and map the coast as well. And it's here, he came back with Captain Dermer. He came back to his first place that he wanted to visit with Patuxet. And when he left, it was a full village. When he got back, that plague that I mentioned 
had happened in the meantime, and it was totally devastated. There was nobody left in Patuxent, which is now Plymouth. And he took Dermer and introduced him to Massasoit, and they did several other things, but Squanto was back. Now, Squanto and Governor Bradford, I believe, formed uh, a very tight, close-knit bond. And uh, if you read Governor Bradford's accounts, I think he almost describes uh, the uh, partially the survival of the pilgrims to Squanto because it was him that plant, he showed them how to plant native corn with the fish and the beans in the mounds and everything. And he got them through that first year so they could have that harvest festival that we call Thanksgiving now. And they, they formed a very close bond and, and you'll see how close in, in, a, in a little bit. Now, Hobbamock, you've probably never heard of Hobbamock before. He was a Panisse. That is a great warrior. If you, can, if you can think of a normal soldier, but then you think of the special forces, this is what the Panisse were. They were really great warriors. And he was sent by Massasoit to live outside of the village of the pilgrims, almost to keep an eye on them, uh, maybe even an eye on Squanto too. Uh, and when he first arrived, he spoke very little English. I, I believe he, he acquired more English as, as time went on. But he and Standish, I think, Miles Standish, the military leader of the pilgrims, uh, of the, the group, uh, formed a tight bond. It was almost a warrior. Uh, friendship because they both were warriors. Standish had been in wars in Europe and in, in Habermark. They could identify with each other. So we have these relationships going on in the background that we're talking about here. Now, shortly after that, that treaty was made where they would assist and in, in, uh, give alliance if they were attacked, this came into play immediately. And I call this the rescue of Squanto. Here's the situation here. Uh, over in Picasset, we had a, a, a sub sachem, chief of that tribe within the Wampanoag nation known as Corbettson. He had kind of had a falling out with Massasoit and he was trying to convince other tribes to join him and join the Narragansett. Well, he was over at Namaskit, and here, here he is. He's trying to convince the Namaskit people to join him. And then he found out, because this was kind of Squanto's home away from home since the Tuxet was no longer, he found out Squanto and Habermach were both at Namaskit. And he took them into captivity. And somehow, Habamak was able to escape and get to Plymouth and tell them what had happened. He also informed them that he heard through the grapevine that Massasoit himself had been captured and was being held down in the Darragansett territory. Well, this set off the alliance. This is a, 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 a period where Massasoit's in trouble, his people are in trouble, so the pilgrims are coming to their aid. And they quickly armed and Habamak led them back to Namaskit, which is in today modern Middleborough, Massachusetts. And this is an actual Native American tra trail that still exists down along these woods here. And they came to Namaskit, which uh, this area is still wooded. If, if you probably dug in the ground, you could find artifacts. It's, it's a uh, um, kind of a recreational area in Middleborough called the Pratt Farm, you can take hikes out here. And uh, they came upon the village, it was nighttime, and they made kind of a surprise attack, not really an attack though. They surprised the villagers. I think, uh, I think it was uh, Standish got on top of one of the wigwams and uh, fired his, his musket off, which just sh sent shockwaves through the, the village. And they found, that Squanto was in the village unharmed, so they came to his aid. He wasn't tied up or anything, though. And uh, Corpitan, the one who was uh, stirring up all the problems, had gone back to Picasso. So it's the next day he 
uh, standards got all, all of the natives together and basically warned them that if Corbett did this again or Massasoit would not return from the Narragansett, there would be a price to pay, in other words. Now, as time went on, they went back to Plymouth. They still thought that Massasoit was in captivity, but they found out later that Massasoit was never taken at all. So this was some kind of a rumor. But what you saw was they lived up to their end of the treaty. They knew that the Wampanoag people needed help and they came to their aid. And then we come to January, 1622. And uh, there's trouble a brewing. Catechus, the sachem of the Narragansett, sent arrows wrapped in rattlesnake skin. A messenger came with this. Now the messenger came saying that they wanted to give this to Squanto. This so I think this was a message from Canicus to Squanto. Squanto wasn't present when it arrived. And when, uh, when Squanto came into the village, Bradford asked him, he was like, what does this mean? And Squanto said, this is a dire threat. They're threatening you and your people. You better get ready. This means they're probably going to come after you. Now, Bradford decided to send back a message of his own. And this is what he sent back with the messenger, musket balls and powder. So basically he's like, okay, you, you wanna play? We're gonna play. And this is how we'll meet your challenge. They also, since they thought that uh, some kind of attack was going to come, they built a palisade around the whole village of Plymouth. And they also placed, uh, uh, I think this is uh, the time where they improved, they had a gun platform and they probably made this into more of a fort at this time. So they're ready for any kind of attack here. Now, as they're waiting for this Narragansett attack, uh, something happened with Squanto. And, and this is something that people rarely hear about. You hear about him helping with the planting of the corn and translating and, uh, and all this, but very few people know of this story. And this is, this is one of the things that really plays into this West Augustan incident here. So uh, one day, uh, the men of Plymouth, they were in their shallop and they were heading out of the harbor. They were heading towards the Gurnet. You're looking at Gurnet right now, um, or Saquish, as they call it as well. Just as they were ready to round Saquish, uh, they were heading for uh, what is now Boston Harbor, the, to uh, truck with the uh, Indians up there. Uh, one of the pieces went off, one of the cannon went off. That, that is a signal that something's wrong. So they turned right around and they came back. And what they had found was uh, one of Squanto's relatives had come staggering out of the woods, all bloodied, saying that uh, what had happened was that Massasoit himself had allied, allied themselves with the Narragansett and they were coming for Plymouth. Now, Habamock, who was in the village, he was still there, heard this, and he was astounded. He, he couldn't believe this story. And he said to Bradford, he said, I would have known of this. I'm, I sit on the council. If some kind of decision like this was made, I would have known about this. And I do not think that Massasoit would do this. So they, they sat and they, they debated on what to do. So, Habamok suggested that his wife travel down to Soams, which was uh, Massasoit's village, to find out what was going on. And that's what they did. And it was in the middle of winter, and she trucked down. This is the path that she took. And she got to that, that village, which is now the site of Warren, Rhode Island. And she found that Massasoit was sitting there. He wasn't allied with the Narragansett. And the truth came out that this was Squanto that set this up. He wanted to set the pilgrims against the natives. And what he was trying to do was displace Massasoit as the chief of the Wampanoags. And they found out furthermore, he had been going from village to village telling them that the pilgrims kept the plague in a barrel and only Squanto could keep them 
from releasing it again. So when Massasoit found out about Squanto's treachery, he wanted Squanto's head. He wanted him. He wanted to fillet him. Now Squanto showed up at Plymouth and Massasoit sent a messenger to hand him over. And it's this time when this, this relationship with Bradford really kicks in and Bradford went against the treaty and refused to release Squanto. And now the relationship between Plymouth and the Wampanoags goes into a deep freeze. Massasoit is not happy about this. This man tried to usurp his power, and now the pilgrims are, are hiding him, harboring him. Luckily, uh, shortly, well, it's not, I guess not luckily, but shortly after this, and I think it's kind of mysterious uh, that this happened, Squanto was along with the pilgrims in their shallop, and they were headed out to Cape Cod to uh, try on a mission of trade, to trade for food. And it's here that he got a bloody nose and just uh, mysteriously died. They brought him on land. He actually died on land. And uh, sources say that Squanto uh, probably is buried around the Eastwood Ho Golf Course in Chatham, if you ever get a chance to go out there. Uh, some people say it's actually the grave is around the second hole. I don't know about that. But uh, it's very convenient this happened. Uh, he just got a bloody nose and died. Uh, to me, that kind of says poison, but this, this is almost 400 years ago. So how, how can we find out? Anyway, uh, relations between the Wampanoag and Plymouth still remain cold because uh, even though Squanto's gone, uh, Bradford did refuse to give him up to Massasoit. So this section is called Rude Fellows, and you'll quickly realize why this is called Rude Fellows. In about May of 1622, a ship called the Sparrow arrived off the coast of Maine. This was sent by uh, Mr. Weston. That ship released a shallop, a small ship, an exploratory ship. And this is the route that they took. And they came in here and they found, right about here, they found a perfect site for a new colony. And then they came and they arrived at Plymouth in their shallop with letters from Mr. Weston saying that the merchant adventurers would be breaking off all relations and cease to supply the new colony. Well, uh, the colonists did not trust Weston and they felt that he was up to something. In fact, that was a lie. That was not true. And he was up to something. He had actually broken away from the merchant adventurers and was going to attempt to plant his own colony. And what he had done, because he thought the pilgrims were too religious, they had families, they were spending too much time praying. What he did was he, he basically dredged the bottom of the London society, the bars, the, the brothels, and came up with some, what he called stout knaves or rude fellows, big strong men that could start a colony and loaded them aboard two ships and sent them to America. And these are the men that would come to be the West Augusta colony. Now, one of the books that I read that really got me into this West Augusta incident was a book written in the 19th century by Charles Francis Adams. And I love this quote about Thomas Weston. It says, he seems to have been a man of not type, not uncommon in the days of Elizabeth and James the first. English adventurers, half traders, half explorers who probably required little inducement only to ripen into something closely resembling a freebooter. His head was full of schemes for deriving a great and sudden gain from a settlement in North America. So this was Weston's objective. He was going to send another colony to compete with Plymouth and try to make some money for himself. And he sent two ships over, the Charity and the Swallow. 
Uh, there were two captains, uh, Weston's brother, Andrew Weston, and his brother-in-law, Mr. Richard Green, who would later become the governor of the West Lagasse colony. Now, the men of the Charity and the Swan come ashore at Plymouth, and uh, they are some of the men are, are discharged onto, the, onto land, and they're given to the pilgrims to take care of while Green goes and sets up the colony in Wessagasse. Now, uh, he only brought a, a skeleton crew with him to do this, and he left the majority of these men, some were sick, in Plymouth. Now, the charity, probably with Andrew Weston aboard, went to Virginia, and they'd return uh, to Plymouth in October and then go back to England. Now, Weston's root fellows were quite a motley crew. And by the way, this is where the colony would be planted. This is the location of West Lagasse. Back in Plymouth, these rude fellows, as I say, were a motley crew. Some were ill, they needed care, while others were able-bodied and refused to work, and thus were a drain on the colony. They were already strained for food anyway. Not long after the arrival, some of the men began to steal corn from the stores and they were summarily flogged. Also, they were making uh, overt um, motions to some of the women in the colony. Th these were just the lowest kind of men that you could imagine. And uh, it was quite a burden to Plymouth. Now, when, when Richard Green came back, and the colony was all ready, and these men boarded the Swan and went back to West Augusta. I, I believe that Plymouth uh, exhaled a collective sigh because these men were rude fellows. So they began the West Augusta colony. Here we have it, satellite view. I'm going to kind of come in on it. This is actually where the colony was. And what I have here is an overlay, a map that was created uh, basically from, some, from uh, what uh, William Brad, uh, not William Bradford, but um, the Boston uh, Puritans uh, created a map showing this colony. Now, if you look here, you see that overlay. Now, according to them, the colony was placed up here on Hunts Hill, uh, which the, the soil from Hunts Hill is long gone. The, the hill was actually leveled to uh, take dirt to fill in um, parts of um, uh, the marshlands around Boston. Uh, my, from my study of everything, I don't think the colony was here, oddly enough. Uh, I think the colony was more in here because there's a lot of archaeological evidence on both sides uh, to kind of indicate that. And right now, this, this location that I'm pointing to that I, I believe was actually the colony is an open park. Oddly enough, it's still open in a sea of suburbia. So it wasn't before long that they were able to build some houses, create a palisade, not too unlike Plymouth. Now, after about a month, the sick were, who were left back in Plymouth joined the colony. And however, not long after the planting of the colony, stories from Native Americans in the area of West Augusta began trickling back into Plymouth. True to form, these rude fellows were again earning their sober cat. Stories related to how the men of uh, West Augusta were having their way with the Native American women in treating the men of the tribe with other disdain and contempt. Also, here's a quote from Bradford. Shortly after the harvest, Mr. Weston's people were now seated at Massachusetts, West Augusta, and by disorder, as it seems, had made havoc of their provisions and began now to perceive want had come upon them. In other words, they were running out of food right away, almost off the bat. Now, uh, the uh, Plymouth Colony and West Augusta got together. They realized that they were in really bad shape and they made several uh, missions together to different Native American tribes to try to, to trade for some food to get to West Agassiz. 
but they kept going through the food so much. They were undisciplined. And things began to deteriorate very quickly. Um, by July, Richard Green, the, the governor of the colony was dead. And another governor was appointed. His name was John Saunders. And stories have come down. I'm, I'm gonna give you a couple stories. Uh, the men had become so weak from starvation. Uh, there's one story of a man who was clamming on this beach that you're looking at right now. And uh, he became mired in the muck just from clamming and he was so weak, he couldn't pull himself out. And they found him days later standing up dead or slumped over dead, I should say. And also here, at this point, the colonists began to resort to becoming a virtual slaves of the, the Massachusetts tribe just to get a little bit of corn. They do anything. So the tables had totally turned. These, these natives that they were mocking and making fun of and, and using their women, now they're in control. They're the ones with the corn. Now they're making these people work for the corn. Now, some of the other men were just simply trying to steal from the natives. And there's another story that comes to us. Um, uh, uh, because of this, the natives, the natives were very, very upset. And uh, what happened, uh, the, the pilgrims got a letter from Saunders. In this letter, suggested that Plymouth and West Augusta band together and attack these natives and take their corn. And the reply from Bradford was, we would never do that. This, this is immoral and it's unjust. And if you do anything like this, we'll come after you and arrest you in so many words. So what they were suggesting Plymouth do, Plymouth totally said, no, we're not gonna do this. And the thing was, they were hearing these stories coming from the West Augustus, but they, they couldn't really do anything because this was another colony. This was another group of people. And then there's another story uh, that comes down to us. They, they say this is the first hanging uh, in the colony in Massachusetts. Uh, one of the West Augustus men was caught stealing and the natives held him and they turned him over to the governor and said, you need to punish this man. This man was stealing from us. And back then, stealing the corn was stealing their livelihood. And they demanded to hang this man. Now, what Saunders decided to do was they found a weakly old man and, and hanged him in the place of the strong, strapping man. This is a story that's come down to us through the years. This is the situation that West Augusta had put themselves into. And, and as you can imagine, the Massachusetts people were not happy with them at all. So it brings us to March of 1623. And th these are the events that lead up to this attack that you might have heard of, the West Augusta incident. In March of 1623, Edward Winslow and Miles Standish are on separate missions. After hearing a Massasoit, Massasoit they heard was dying down in Sowams. They dispatched Edward Winslow to, to see if he could provide any assistance to Massasoit. Now, Edward Winslow um, really admired these native people. He actually, he was probably the only one of the pilgrims to pick up their tongue. He could actually speak in the Algonquin dialect that the Wampanoags used. So he was the perfect man to go down and see Massasoit. Remember the relations are very cold. They're about to defrost. Miles Standish was sent on a trade mission to Manomet on the Cape. And these are what these are the incidents that happened. Now here's a, a, a portrait of Ed, Edward Winslow. I think it's the only portrait of a pilgrim actually made during his lifetime. And here we have this famous statue of Massasoit, Osamequin. Uh, Winslow came, he found that Massasoit was on death's doorstep. He was blind, he uh, was running a high temperature, he was yellow looking. And uh, when he heard Winslow there was there, his friend Winslow was there, he was overjoyed. He said, is it you, is it you Winslow? And Winslow said, it's me. 
And what he did was, uh, it's it, in the in the sources. I, I don't know what it was, but Winslow whipped up what they call the physic, which the research I've done is a, a diuretic or something, and gave it to Massasoit. And, and within an hour, Massasoit regained his sight. Within a day, he was cured. And as you could imagine, Massasoit is very, very grateful to Winslow. And it's here that he divulges what he knows. He knows that the Massachusetts natives have been going around to all the tribes in the area and forming an alliance because they are going to attack Wessagusset and Plymouth. Massasoit's advice was to take out the leadership, the two sachems in, in uh, the Massachusetts, and that would be uh, Paxuit and Wittawamit who were the, the local leaders in that. If you take them out, that will frighten everybody to death and you'll avoid a massive attack, massive slaughter. And eventually that's, they took that advice. Now here's what happened with uh, Miles Standish on his mission. And he went to Manomet, which uh, is actually in this location. We have a Manomet section of Plymouth, not really in the same location. But he went in there and he was, again, he was going to trade to, to uh, get uh, corn. And it was here that he came across Wittawamit, who was one of the sachems I just mentioned from West Agusset. And he was trying to convince the Manomet people to join him in a league against these English. Now he was giving this fiery speech to the, the chief of the Manomet and he didn't think that Standish knew what he was saying, but Standish had picked up a little bit and he knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying that he wanted these people to join them against both West Augusset and Plymouth. And at one point, he even threatened Standish by holding a knife out. And on the, on the knife was a carving of a face that was happy and one that was sad. And he pointed the one that said sad, that looked sad at, at uh, at Standish and basically said, you're gonna be looking like this pretty soon. Standish knew exactly what was going on and he went back to Plymouth and reported this. And then another event happened. Phineas Pratt was uh, by now, the, he was one of the members of the West Augusta colony. He was by now kind of the de facto leader because John Saunders who had become the new governor had, uh, decided to get in the shell up and go up to Maine looking for food. He never came back. So uh, this guy, Phineas Pratt was uh, kind of left in charge. Here, here's his grave. He actually was born and uh, buried in Charlestown, Massachusetts. His grave's still there. Now, uh, years later when he applied, he tried to get a pension for his service as one of the first comers. And uh, he wrote his narrative about what happened. And, after Saunders left, he knew that the situation in West Augusta was untenable. Men are starving. They're nothing more than slaves. And he, he could hear the rumblings among the natives. He knew that something was up. He knew there was an impending attack. And he knew he had to get out of there. He had to get to Plymouth and let them know. So when he was able, he was, he was out pretending to get the, the ground ready for planting. He what he did was he snuck off and made a beeline for Plymouth. Now a beeline would be this. Here is West Augusta to Plymouth. And the natives discovered that he was gone. And he, he at times he thought they were hot on his heels. But he made it to Plymouth on March 21st, uh, uh, March 24th, 1623, stumbled through the gates and alerted Plymouth to what was happening, what was going to happen. He knew of an attack that was impending. Massasoit already had told them, and also uh, Miles Standish picked up that there was an attack impending too. Now, this is what led to the decision to strike. Not only those factors, but also the factor that a year before in Jamestown, 347 colonists had been killed with a surprise attack from the natives down there. So they were very wary of that. So as I say, what contributed to this decision to strike West Augusta? 
the story of Phineas Pratt that they had just gotten, Miles Standish's experience in Manomet, and also the advice of NASA Sawyer to take out the leadership. So within, within a day or two, they mustered about 10 men. They hopped aboard the shallop and they headed for Wessagusset. And when they landed, they found the swan was still anchored out in there in the little harbor there. And it was abandoned, there was nobody there. Uh, they, came, they came ashore, they tried to signal, nobody came and they, they were afraid that these men were already dead. When they got into, uh, they came aboard, this is what they looked like getting off the shallop. Not a lot of men with Miles Standish at the head. They came into the village and they found some of the men there. And uh, what Standish did, he took command immediately. He said, look, go out and do this quietly. Get everybody inside the Palisades. Gather everybody together, okay? And they did that. Within a day, everybody was brought in. Now what Standish had in mind, was to somehow lure the two leaders uh, into the enclosure and uh, into a blockhouse. They had a blockhouse. This is what a blockhouse looks like. It's kind of a mini fortress. And the, uh, the reason that uh, Standard Study was there was to trade. And oddly enough, uh, Pexwit and Winnetomic showed up. And I don't know if they really believed that he wanted to trade or not, or they were just curious as to why, why the heck is Standish here? So what he did was he uh, had them come into the blockhouse. Here's Miles Standish. Here's what that might have looked like. Said, we have here, we have goods to trade in here. Come on in here. And he got Wittetomit, Pexwit, and I believe it was um, Wood Atomic's younger brother inside the blockhouse. And then Standish looked at one of his men and gave him the signal. They shut the door. Now, Wood Atomic, if you remember, had a knife around his neck and he grabbed the knife. Standish grabbed the knife right off of his neck and began to wildly stab these two. They were just totally encompassed and the men murdered those two right there. Now the young brother, after, after these two men were just murdered, the young brother was taken out and just strung up on a tree. Brutal. Now after this, uh, they had several skirmishes with the local natives. I think maybe one or two got killed. Most of them were just frightened to death by the musket shots going off. And uh, what happened was that they just retreated. Now, this is what the scene looked like when these men returned victorious with all the men from West Agusa. Oh, by the way, this is, a, this is a monument that's in Weymouth Bay. I'll give you a, a couple seconds to look at that. Now, this was originally placed um, by, I believe, the Daughters of the Society of Colonial Wars in 1923. And back then their take on it was that this was a great thing because this was done and it averted probably a larger scale war that could have been much more costly, which I agree with. Uh, if, uh, if there had been attacked, there had, would have been much more people dead. But this is how Standish returned to Plymouth. This was a common thing done in England. If you were uh, a criminal, they would place your head on a pike and put it on London Bridge and warn people. They probably placed this up on the Palisade of Plymouth as a warning. And this warning was very, very effective. After the word got out, uh, the Native American chiefs in the, in the different tribes of the Wampanoag Nation uh, uh, left their villages and went to hide in the swamps and in the forests because they thought that Standish was going to be on his way for them. Massasoit was right. This would frighten 
the rest of the NATOs and it stopped the conspiracy dead in its heels. So you can imagine the, a, a lot of these people ended up in these swamps. And uh, because of the bad conditions out in the swamp, they spent quite a while out there. Uh, some of the major sachems actually died during this period. And it, uh, it, it set the tone for, I guess, how to deal with Native Americans in the future, because it wouldn't be too long before we had the Pequot War, and it wouldn't be too long before King Philip's War, where the same kind of tactics were used. So I'd like to say thank you for having me today. And uh, if there are any questions, maybe Tom, we could uh, field those if you want to do that. And uh, I'll just let this video run in the background. This is the actual site of the Wessagusset colony today. Questions from anyone? Has anyone put in a question via chat? I'm a descendant of Stephen Hopkins, who was yes. on the Mayflower and part of the Mayflower contract. Yes. Yeah. And I think, um, I think it was uh, what Massasoit spent, is it Massasoit spent his, uh, the night with the pilgrims in Stephen Hopkins' house? Am I, is that my recollection true? I'm sorry, I don't hear you very well. Uh, I asked, uh, I have a recollection or a, a memory uh, that I came across, I guess, that uh, Massasoit spent the night after he made the treaty with the pilgrims in Stephen Hopkins' house. I don't know. You haven't heard that? But I do know he was friendly with the Indians and he had been in Jamestown. Yes. Uh, and in Bermuda before that and, he, and had was, part of the Mayflower contract. It, uh, and he actually was not one of the separatists. He was not one of the religious uh, pilgrims, so to say. I, I'm sorry. Uh, he, he was he, not one of the separatists. He, he was just a regular Englishman. He, he was, uh, I've read a book about him and um, he was on the ship going to Jamestown mm -hmm. that was Shakespeare's model for the Tempest. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, it was a brand new ship and he was a yeoman who could read and write. And uh, because of that, he was appointed the person who had to read the Bible every Sunday uh -oh. and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, then uh, the ship started to sink because the caulking was brand new and the older ships, the caulking was firmer, mm -hmm. but uh, the sun came out uh, after this hurricane and they were fully exhausted. They were going to let the ship go down and pray to God, mm -hmm. but uh, then they saw land. And so they rushed, uh, they rushed to Bermuda but they crash landed on the shore. They didn't have time to choose a spot and broke the keel of the ship. Mm. And uh, of course, gentlemen did not work with their hands. So the yeoman and all the other people had to build all the houses and do all the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he made the remark that uh, he thought the workers ought to have some say in how they were governed. Mm -hmm. And he had a a noose put around his neck for that and retracted it. But this, <laughs> but this did go back eventually in the reports to the group that was sending them. Mm -hmm. Well, then they finally did get the ship repaired and went on to Jamestown, uh, didn't bring food of which they had plenty in Bermuda, but uh, then he starved there in Jamestown for a while. And uh, he had left his pregnant wife behind in England with a couple of children. And so he went back to England. He discovered the wife was dead and married somebody else. And then the pilgrims came along and they were very happy to have him because of his experience in, Ameri in America previously. So he went along uh, on the Mayflower and uh, this time he brought his pregnant wife with him. Mm -hmm. She had a baby called Oceanus, born yeah. in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. But the wording in the Mayflower contract uh, 
is identical to the wording that he was almost hanged for in Bermuda. Mm. They, uh, there's a book about this. I'm trying to think what the name of it is. Came out last year um, and I have read it and it talked a lot about mm. Stephen Hopkins. That's interesting. And then after he got there, uh, he opened an ordinary, an inn. And because he wasn't a pilgrim, he uh, broke a lot of blue laws. So he left a big paper trail in America. And, That's good uh, for researchers and uh, descendants. What? That's good for researchers, I would say. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, he was friendly with Indians and there were bar fights and all kinds of things. So he left quite a big paper trail and they wrote a book about him. But then there's this other book. Uh, I, right now I'm, I'm 96 years old and I can't remember the name of the author or the title, but it was, yeah, yeah the title is Marooned. Oh. Uh, and I've forgotten the name of the author. Oh, but thank you. That's a book that just came out a year or two ago. Oh, I'll and have he, to check that out. He has a big part in it. Thank you so much. I, I often find that when I, I, I do another lecture called 1620, the first year, a lot of descendants uh, will come to these lectures and they've got so many fascinating stories because they know, they know a lot about their individual descendant and they can tell you these stories. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Anyone Tom, else? were there any questions in the chat? I didn't look to see. Let's see here. I am not seeing Sharon McDonald. Hi, Sharon. Tom. Go ahead, Sharon. Um, I I have heard in in uh, kind of propaganda, and I don't know if it's true that they used the head to play football with. It sounded terribly, mm. terribly cruel. Have you? Heard that story? Uh, I, it's not in any of the primary sources, I don't think. Uh, and you, Good. You, you get things that come down through hearsay, and you know you can't really place a lot of credence in that. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in Bradford or uh, Mort's relation about them kicking it. Good. Yeah, Good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Even though they, they still did bring that head back and uh, they would do the same thing years later with King Philip. Hmm. They'd bring his head back to Plymouth too. That's something they don't talk about when you go to Plymouth Plantation. Others? Um. Yes, yes. Any more questions? I'm not hearing any. What, Carol? Um, I think I'm on you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I'm just, I'm just amazed at the brutality uh, re, re, uh, revolving around Miles Standish. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember anything like that from the, the little bit that we were taught about Miles Standish, and no. I see other people smiling when, no. when I was getting, we were what we were taught in grade school no. and, and all. It's just, it's, it's striking how brutal this was. It's, uh, it's not uh, anything out of the ordinary for the times. The, the times were like that, that's how they were. Yeah. And uh, people think we live in violent times now. I think uh, we're a lot less violent. And he was a soldier, he had been involved in wars uh, on the continent. And yeah, uh, that, that's the kind of stuff they did back then. I have another comment. Um, I was reading probably at the beginning of this week in the mass historical, you know, that little story thing that comes out every mm -hmm. week. And it was the whole story of Wessagusa. Did you oh. see it? I, I get that in my email. I haven't looked at it yet, but I should. I was so, I was so excited because yeah. I thought maybe it was you. No, and no. Thought, oh, <laughs> wow. And we're going to meet him no. on Sunday. But it, it was mm -hmm. uh, it quite of what you said. So maybe I, whoever wrote it heard your lecture. 
I glimpsed at it. I didn't really, I didn't look at it very quickly. You know, I see things in my email and I look at them very quickly. Then I have to go correct papers and stuff. So um, I don't get to read as much as I'd like, but uh, I, it's probably put out this month because all this happened in March. Oh. So that's probably why they did oh. that. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Anything else? Carol. Um, well, I'm just wondering, Chris, do you think that this, these incidents or the Wessagusset incidents and the other, uh, the way the uh, colonists treated the Native Americans was the reason that, that this country was, you know, continued to brutalize Native Americans mm -hmm. throughout history? Uh, this, you know, I, I, in my heart of hearts, I'd like to think if it was just the pilgrims and nobody else came, this wouldn't happen. But, um, you know, eventually more Puritans came and they were no better than uh, the Wessagusset people when it came to dealing with Native Americans. But again, you have to look at, you can't look at it through the prism of the 21st century. You have to look at it as things were back then. And that's how they were back then. They, uh, the, the natives were brutal to each other as well. Uh, there were wars in, in all of the world and this is how things were. Uh, and like I say, I think we're, we're more sensitive to those things today. And yes, the, the treatment of the Native Americans was bad, but if you go through history, um, you could talk about uh, many instances of uh, of nations and groups of people that have been brutalized. It's, it's human history. It's nothing new. Sorry to say, I, I, um, I wish that there'd be some kind of gen genetic mutation where we could stop this violence and somehow um, it's, uh, we still have that animalistic instinct and it, it's still with us today. And talking about the nation as a whole, there's the whole story of how uh, in Florida there were originally some fairly positive relationships yeah. between the uh, the Spanish settlers and the native people, and then people like Desoto came along who were just utterly brutal. Oh, they were horrible. Brutal and all that and mm -hmm. changed it. Oh, uh, the, the, the Spanish conquistadors were. Oh, the penultimate. They were they were worse than. Uh, oh boy, you talk about Pizarro and some of those people. Yeah, yeah. And it it did start with Columbus. Um, even and even when you get into the 19th century, when we were having our so-called manifest destiny, uh, there were a lot of treaties made, a lot of uh, promises broken. Uh, and uh, I thought I thought you were going to actually mention the charity that were taken and uh, driven into Oklahoma, the Trail of Tears. You can go on and on and on. Uh, there are just so many wrongs that have been done to the Native American people. Other, I, I was. Uh kind of interested a number of years ago when, when Senator Elizabeth Warren got into all that trouble for mm. claiming Indian heritage. Mm. It seems odd that um, on the one hand, we glorify Indians, Hiawatha, the noble mm. savage, that long tradition. And on the other hand, uh, have this terrible history of t treating them with mm. utter disdain. But I think anybody who's got um, Yankee roots, um, has some family story about somebody who married an Indian or, mm -hmm. or an Indian connection. And those are often considered sort of um, uh, badges of authenticity or, mm -hmm. or something like that. So I was kind of surprised when she got, uh, when Senator Warren got such a hassle um, about uh, mm -hmm. having Indian ancestry, because I, I think there are many families in America that have similar stories. It, it's odd, Dorothy, that you say that. If you went back a hundred years, they would cover it up. They wouldn't. They wouldn't want to admit it. It's. It's only become recent since I think the 1960s that it's become, uh, kind of as you say, a badge of honor or something like that. Um, and uh, it. It is. It's like. Uh, and it's. It's almost in itself the, this idea of the noble savage. 
that in itself, I think, is kind of bogus uh, as well. That, you know, just that, uh, because they were people just like us. They, they, uh, it's like, I think too many people have seen Dances with Wolves and just think that Native Americans just camped out and were friendly and, uh, and, and I'm not minimizing the brutality to them, but they, they had wars, they had conquests. Just talking today about um, Massasoit needing an, an ally against the Narragansett because the, the Narragansett would have conquered the Wampanoag. So um, they, it, it, this, this, is, uh, this is kind of uh, curious, I think, that uh, people uh, have these uh, cliched ideas about Native Americans and, oh, I'm Native American. And it's, we're coming to find out that a lot of people who claim that now through ancestry, they're finding out that they don't have it, uh, as Elizabeth Warren did. And when they did actually research her history, it was found that uh, one of her relatives actually participated in uh, some of the wars against the natives out in Oklahoma. Anyone else? I think we have about done it then. Uh, thank you very much for participating in this thank meeting you. today. And if there's no further question, and I don't see one, then I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned. Sine die, so to speak. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Chris. Bye, Betty.